Every Friday for the next few weeks, I'm going to take on the arduous task of looking at all of the Friday the 13th films to celebrate the Shout Factory's monumental release of the Friday the 13th Collection Deluxe Edition box set. While I've reviewed these films before, my thoughts on them have evolved through the years. This is a brand new presentation of each of the films with all kinds of new bells and whistles. And honestly, I don't mind returning to Crystal Lake now and again simply because this is my favorite horror series of all time. Scoff all you want, movie snobs. I don't really care. Even the worst Friday the 13th has some redeeming qualities in my eyes. This second week of the series features, you guessed it, Friday the 13th Part 2. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights, a part of the Kings of Horror Network. I'm M.L. Miller. While you might be watching this video on the Kings of Horror Network, I urge you to click over to my M.L. Miller Frights page and give it a like, share with your buddies across the electronic superhighway, click subscribe to this channel, and don't forget to ring that bell for notifications. Please get the word out to new folks so we can make the Kings of Horror Network, as well as M.L. Miller Frights, bigger and better. Friday the 13th Part 2 was released in 1981. It was directed by Steve Miner and written by Ron Kurtz based on characters created by Victor Miller. Even from the shocking opening moments of Friday the 13th Part 2, there's a lot of metaphor to be read into the story. A small boy plays in a puddle. He's called in by his overprotective mother, and as he walks away, a large boot splashes into the puddle immediately after. Right away the message is clear. The boy has been replaced by the man. While adhering to the basic structure established in the first film, Friday the 13th Part 2 sets the tone for all of the sequels to follow. Five years after the original massacre at Camp Blood, another set of campers set up in the cabins across the lake. This group, like the first, are fun-loving, sex-crazed, and rambunctious, just the type of fodder that always lines up to be chopped down in these films. Though no Academy Awards are going to be given to any of the actors here, at least they seem to give it their all. Unlike recent stock and slash flicks, this cast isn't packed with GQ and Maxim models, making the kids in this one a little bit more relatable and downright earthy, and to me that's more appealing. And you find yourself actually caring whether they live or die. Every one of these kids in peril could be you or I, something modern horror doesn't seem to get by populating their films with ridiculous good lookings. Unlike other sequels, there are a few things different in this film that make Friday the 13th a little bit more frightening than the rest. First and foremost, I've always been a fan of the Baghead Jason. The hockey mask has become an iconic symbol of the series, but it wasn't until the next chapter that our hero dons his famous ice hockey faceplate. The Baghead, reminiscent of the hooded killer in the town that dreaded Sundown, and the mask the Zodiac Killer was known to wear, always seemed more frightening with its ruggedness and simplicity. Jason is a faceless killer in this film, but the mere glimmer of an eye through the hole in the mask is infinitely more frightening than any goalie from hell look, in my opinion. Also in this film, Jason is not treated as a lumbering oaf. Played here by Warrington Gillette and stuntman Steve Dash, this Jason is sophisticated enough to call his first victim on the telephone, Friday the 13th survivor Alice, played by Adrian King. To make sure she's home and even knows to take the kettle off the oven so as not to alert the neighbors of his kill. He sets snare traps for his victims and is much cleverer here than in later films. Stalking the campers set to reopen Camp Crystal Lake, learning about their personalities before hunting and dispatching them. The controversy over who should get credit of Jason's performance is an interesting one. Dash played Jason for a long period of time in the film as he took the brunt of quite a beating from Ginny which required a lot of stunts. So most of the time you see Jason, it's Dash. But Gillette gets credit as the role of Jason and was in the integral unmasked scene at the end as he bursts through the window. Ironically, this is a scene where the actor who played Jason got hurt when he broke through the glass. Had it been Dash in the part at that time, there might not have been an injury with the trained stuntman doing it. Later in the series, the part was cast with solely one person starring as Jason, and that was usually a stunt person. Maybe not so as to run into the same issues. 
Final girl Ginny, played by Amy Steele, seems to be the only one who actually wants to be a counselor here. She tries to psychoanalyze the legend of Jason after an ominous tale by the campfire. It's because of Ginny's resourcefulness that part two has got one of the best cat and mouse chase scenes, a concept that is lost in the series in later installments. In the end, it's this empathy and understanding that saves Ginny as she fools Jason into thinking she is his mother long enough to deliver a final blow. But of course, as with the first film, the Shakaru ending makes it difficult to understand whether or not the survivors live or die, or if the unmasked Jason who crashes through the window at the end is just the nightmare of a traumatized victim. Personally, I don't like the dream ending idea. That's more Freddy Krueger territory. I think it's much more effective to have the dream endings in part one and two to be actually happening in reality. Though that leaves the question as to what the hell happened to Paul and poor Muffin, and because we don't know if the end is a dream, we still don't know if that pile of bones and fur in the forest is Little Muffin or not. At least the poor thing died with a smile on its face. As far as final girls go, though, Ginny, played by Steele, was pretty perfect and really stands out as one of the few who actually got under Jason's skin and into his mind more so than any other final girl. It's funny that Steele became a counselor later in life after leaving acting. This was revealed in the podcast interview included in the disc's special features section. Though this is a great addition to the Friday the 13th franchise, it's definitely not the most original. Some of the kills are almost exactly swiped from Mario Bava's Bay of Blood, a.k.a. Twitch of the Death Nerve. Director Miner amps up the tension by having the camera follow the weapon as Jason moves closer towards his victim. Miner also highlights the sex and death angle, not only by killing off any camper who has sex, but cutting, but cutting to people having sex immediately after someone is killed. Miner also keeps the mystery angle that was pervasive in the original going until the end of Part 2. Though the identity of the killer is common knowledge by now, you have to understand that at this point in the series, the film is set up to be somewhat of a mystery. There most definitely is a killer stalking the campers, but who it is remains a mystery until the end. One popular fan theory that I like, but I don't necessarily think works, relates to the fact that Jason is covered in hair in Part 2, yet completely hairless in Part 3, which is supposed to occur only days after the events of Part 2. Some believe the hairy Jason is actually Jason's father, Elias Voorhees, and Jason doesn't even show up until Part 3, as he is as bald there as he was shown as the boy in Part 1. I don't buy it, but apparently before the plug was pulled for the latest and 13th chapter of the series, one of the never-made film's twists was that Jason's father kills folks for a while before Jason takes up the mantle. It's an interesting theory, but one I have trouble with. The most probable reason for the hair loss is that it was cheaper to do a mask without hair than it is to do one with it. My inner logic connecting the series also adds that Jason was so distraught after having to kill the entire camp in part two that once he escapes, he has overnight alopecia, a real thing, look it up, and loses all of his hair immediately due to that stress. So he's hairless when part three's fodder arrives. But attempting to make sense of this type of inconsistency is pointless, as the truth is, the film series was making it up as they went along. The kills in this film are especially brutal. A spear is stuck between two kids having sex, swiped directly from Bay of Blood. Friday the 13th Part 2 continues to set the bar high after Savini's blood-filled rampage effects on the original. The highlight in this particular re-release of the box set is the recently found gore footage that was previously edited from the final cut by the MPAA. Most of these scenes are simply longer, bloodier versions of the original ones. There's a cool extension of Alice's kill at the beginning where we see the ice pick actually coming out the other side of her nose after going into her temple. The extended scene of Scott's death really gives more of an impact as the blood pours from his neck after being the first to die of a machete wound in the series, but not the last. There's also an extended scene of the Sandra slash Jeff sex slash death which actually shows the spear going through the lovers and it ends up being much bloodier and more disturbing a nude scene of sandra was filmed but apparently destroyed because they found out that the actress playing her was underage which in the end i think is a good thing that the footage was lost these extended cuts show up in the special features section but i kind of wish they would have incorporated it into the movie somehow 
though I'm sure that would have taken a lot of time and it would have delayed the release of this box set. A couple of firsts occur in this film. It's the first nudity of the series with the svelte Terry, Kristen Baker, who decides to go skinny dipping. It's the first showing of Jason's house where he keeps a shrine to his mother, later revisited in part three. And the first use of a chainsaw, though it's used by Ginny and not Jason himself. It's the first and last time someone thought bursting out some brown satin panties for a hookup was a good idea. It's the first time an African American or an Asian person was in the series, though they never get lines or even a death scene, as they were part of the crowd who went out partying and missed the bloodbath. It's also the first in what became a standard in the following films, the unmasking to see what kind of ugly metamorphosis Jason has gone through since the last film. This bearded lumberjack Jason is not my favorite Jason FX, but it's a pretty good evolution from the kid who leaves from the lake in the original. One of the major problems I had with part two is that it killed off one of the coolest characters of the series, Crazy Ralph, played by Walt Gorney. He may have been made fun of when he warned the campers that Camp Crystal Lake had a death curse and that they were all doomed, but it made for some of the most memorable scenes in the early parts of the series. Killing off Ralph might have added to the body count, but it took out one of the characters that could have made for some nice continuity from one movie to the next. What did Ralph know about the lake? What made him crazy? We'll never know. The series attempted to replace Ralph with other old codgers with prophecies of doom, but none of them compared to Crazy Ralph's chilling delivery. I also noticed that the jokester, Ted, played by Stuart Charno, not to be mixed up with Ned, the prankster from the first film, never gets killed by Jason. He stays at the bar when Ginny and Paul leave and actually survives the night. Maybe it's because Jason has a sense of humor and likes Ted's offensive jokes, but Ted also seems to have somewhat of a poop fetid, given that the two jokes he tells centers on it, which is kind of weird. In true Mandala effect fashion, for some reason I remember a shot of Ted at the end being distraught having lost all of his friends while he was out boozing. This scene doesn't seem to exist, but I guess it's something I dreamt of after repeated viewings of the sequel. I think it's the continuity that makes this first few Friday the 13th films so special. The later films forgot about all of that and wanted one and done stories. This one began where the first ended, acknowledging the history that was just building. It made you want to seek out the original and watch it back to back. Sure, the storyline is almost identical, but the evolution of the killer from Pamela Voorhees to her son felt like parts of a bigger story. I think that's what makes Friday the 13th so special. Jason wasn't the Jason we know in part one. As the series went on, we saw Jason grow and evolve. Jason got better in each sequel. You just don't get that in any of the other slashers of the time. This time around, I noticed that Pamela Voorhees doesn't pronounce her last name in the same way it is popularly pronounced. The stressor is on the first syllable, for, rather than the last one, he's. So it's Voorhees, not Voorhees, which is how I've heard it pronounced even in the latter films. It's just one of those I've always pronounced this wrong moments that hopefully I'll be able to delete from my vocabulary from here on out. As you can tell, I'm a big fan of part two. I've seen it quite a few times and never really get sick of revisiting it. It's got some great kills, some absolutely suspenseful moments, another great score by the master Henry Manfredini, and one hell of an ending with an unmasked Jason taking care of business, though the above controversy about it remains to this day. If you're looking for one of the better installments of the Friday the 13th series, this first sequel is tough to top. That'll be it for today. Please chime in in the comments and let me know what you think of this video, how on the nose or mind-numbingly wrong I am, or you can counter with your own review. If you like this video, please pound that thumbs up button. Share this video with your social media addicted pals. If you're looking for written reviews, you can find them on mlmillerwrites.com. Don't forget, I have two new horror comic book trade paperbacks you should look for. Grave Trancers is out right now, and Pirouette, collecting never-before-published issues, will be out in November 18th in only the finest of comic book stores. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and ring that bell for alerts to be the first to see my future videos. Thank you so much for your time, and take care. Stuck inside your reality
Yeah.